from Dr. Craig Stephen Wright. Well, thank you, Steve. So one of the themes that we really want to explore here is something that's right at the heart of Bitcoin, um, which is the Bitcoin script language. Um, it's been the subject of uh, quite a bit of misunderstanding and uh, uh, speculation. Um, and in fact, it's um, something that we in the Bitcoin SV team have had to spend quite a lot of uh, time focusing on because as part of the, uh, the Genesis restoration, um, it was one of the trickier pieces to, um, to work through. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the history of mm. Bitcoin Script and, and how it came to be, because um, I think, uh, correct me if I have the date wrong, but August 2017, uh, sorry, August uh, 2008, the Bitcoin white paper came out. Mm -hmm. um, and it described a transaction as a chain of digital signatures. Um, it didn't actually mention the word script at all. Uh, and then a while later, the, uh, the Bitcoin 0.1 code came out. And in fact, that strict definition of a chain of digital signatures uh, seems to have been replaced with a chain of valid scripts. Now, almost all those scripts use digital signatures. And so um, this has actually led to quite a lot of speculation about uh, what scripts place in, uh, in the original Bitcoin design was. In fact, it's been speculated that it was a last minute addition. So can you tell us about how script made it into uh, Bitcoin? Well, as I've said before, it's not really script. It's, uh, I mean, it's a scripting language, but it's a predicate. So first we have to consider that it's a predicate system. Now, for those who don't understand, a predicate is a logical construct that ends in one of three ways, um, two of which are valid, true, false, and syntactically incorrect. So, I mean, there are things you can have that are neither true or false, of course, like this sentence is a lie, yep. those sort of things. So, uh, but we don't worry about those because they won't pass anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, why did I have script in there um, or a predicate? Because you don't have a single way of using money or um, how people use negotiable instruments or promissory notes or anything like this. So you, you can't really dictate commerce. And if you have a commercial system that is highly structured, then people will break it and find a way around it. So throughout history, if you study monetary history, you find very quickly that people in commercial endeavors always find ways around the system. Mm. Now, in something that is prescribed, if you don't allow people to actually create something outside of the base sort of methodology, then they're not going to use it. They're going to create something else. So. If we want people using Bitcoin, we have to allow them to think of different ways of using it. Um, hence, sort of adding things like um, some of the original simple script items like um, two of three and all of this. So the primary use case was always cash, but um, I wanted to see what other things people would invent. And so the way that script has actually been used in, um, in the... I guess the, the, the mutations of Bitcoin um, uh, up until uh, BSV restored uh, the full functionality of script in, in the Genesis upgrade was, was severely constrained and limited. Um, yes. There were, well, they, they have this notion of a standard transaction and in fact the largest part of the definition of that is particular script templates uh, that were allowed, pay to public key hash being a common one that we, um, uh, most of us use uh, every day. So the argument is made, why not, um, if you're only going to allow certain types of scripts, why not just hard code them? It'd be a lot more efficient, uh, computationally efficient. Um, uh, but uh, I think this goes to what you're talking about. If uh, you, you end up in developer wars again, don't you? Someone decides actually, exactly. I don't want to do pay your public key hash exactly that way. And then you have someone sitting over everything going, this is what you need to do. And that opens up avenues for corruption and other such things. Uh, the developers then who sit in charge can be bribed. I'll add something that suits you, but not this guy, all of these sort of things. So if you want true independence, you need people to be able to do what they want without interacting 
mm. not having to go to the great and mighty masters and go, excuse me, sir, please, please, can you add this? Mm. So um, uh, the the flip side of that argument then is why not allow uh, why not allow new op codes? Uh, I would argue that you don't need them because you can replicate the functionality of of, of almost any. Uh, but we will start talking about the restrictions of script shortly. But well, there are two parts to that. Um, you don't have stability when you allow new op codes. Mm. So people will sit there going, "But it's backward compatible," but it never really is. And it requires changes and um, you don't have a stable system anymore. Yeah. So as you start opening it up and changing things, you have to have everyone migrate and you can't have old versions and new versions and things like this. Yeah. So um, you end up with this system that becomes fluid and once again, um, someone will be able to uh, be bribed or paid off to add an opcode or someone else will change something else that will affect things differently. And you can't plan and code how things will affect each other over time. Mm. So um, anyone who's done any secure coding, especially in you know, assembly or C or anything like this, where it's not um, type constrained and it's not, um, it, I mean, you don't have all the controls around something like .NET or, or whatever else, um, you've got to remember that new functions can affect old ones. So opcodes, you might sit there going, this is perfect, I know how it works. But anyone who's coded for a while starts to realize you don't actually know how something uh, that's added will impact old things. It's actually impossible. This is part of some of the research people like Destraka and uh, whatever else did in the past. Um, when you add something, you don't know how it's going to impact everything else. Although the script might be a predicate, the underlying system itself, of course, is um, fully looped, fully um, sort of enabled with everything that a normal full compiler has to run. And when you start adding one function, how does it impact everything else? Yeah. So there are some functions that are actually fully uh, describable or, or able to be replicated in script. And um, I'll use the example of op reverse because mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin Cash recently went through a hard fork and mm -hmm. um, it appears the entire point of that hard fork was to add this one op code. But as I've demonstrated in uh, my presentation just a short time ago, mm -hmm. op reverse is quite trivial to, to implement um, uh, in script. Um, so that leads me to something that that really bugs me about the the history of Bitcoin and particularly Bitcoin Cash. When we first started re-enabling opcodes, of course, this was back in the Bitcoin Cash days. The um, the string opcodes, uh, op left, op right, and op substring, um, ended up being uh, replaced with uh, basically op split, um, which you can now use in combination with some other opcodes to replicate the functions of those. But it does bug me that we, we basically, uh, in, in case anyone doesn't know the, the history, we didn't really have an option here um, because of the uh, you know, politics of the time. Um, it was except this sort of uh, minimal and slightly different uh, set of opcodes that could give us identical functionality or not do it at all. What's your opinion on whether we should bring those original ones back? Is it worth the headache? It becomes difficult now. Um, we're moving from sort of an alpha to a beta and then eventually commercial sort of phase. And um, there was a little bit of leeway in the alpha stages of Bitcoin for experimentation. Mm. But we're really getting past that. People are building applications now. And once you get into that, you, you start impacting third parties. Um, if we want to have a stable environment that people are going to build on, we can't start playing with it too much. Mm. I agree. And uh, I mean, the script opcodes are about as fundamental as it gets. Mm. Uh, just for the record, of course, the functionality of left, right and substring are, are, um, are completely uh, replicatable using existing opcodes. And in fact, with some of the tooling, that it, it is fairly trivial to do so. It's uh, the fact that it keeps me up at night and bugs me is 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 probably more to do with historical politics. I think a lot of that was just to bug me because I sort of argued quite strongly that I wanted the originals and yeah. and um, Armory, uh, well, 
did everything he could to make sure that didn't happen. Well, in fact, that conversation, uh, it was Gavin Andreessen uh, uh, popped into that conversation. Mm. Um, and I mean, I genuinely think and Gavin's uh, heart was in the right place, but mm. um, uh, the original idea for, for Opslit um, uh, came from him. And to be honest, at the time, I was sort of quite enamored of the idea of simplicity as a, as a principle. but. Um, it wasn't until later when I started considering the sort of underlying efficiency of being able to pull a single byte out of a very long string uh, and how that actually looks when you use OpSplit is, um, is quite a lot more expensive. Well, this is actually an interesting thing. We, we spoke about something earlier today, which was um, uh, Wozniak was nearly fired from Apple back in the early days of Apple because... Uh, people were looking at how many lines of code he produced mm. and um, he was constantly coming up with negative results because he was taking and refactoring other people's code to make them run faster because he didn't like what they were doing. Mm. And um, he, he thought it was horrible and not efficient so he rewrote everyone's code throughout the organisation. And management, of course, just looked at this and said, you're not doing anything mm. and um, just thought he was a burden. Now. This is probably somewhere where Bitcoin might change some of the attitudes. Mm. When people start paying per line of code, and it's not you're paying your staff how many lines do they do, um, and we'll give them a bonus if they get extra lines, which is very easy to do, by the way. If you want to get your bonus, you just put a whole lot of trash code in there that does nothing and slows down the system, um, or just puts a loop in for the sake of putting a loop in or sleeps for a line or all sorts of stupid things that you can then fix later and get another bonus. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, but the fact here is now, if we're going to be uh, paying less money to have a smaller script, mm. um, one that's more efficient, and it's actually charged, then the economics come a completely different way to the bloat software that we're producing now, mm. rather than having how big can I make my software, hello Microsoft, um, we can go back to this small, efficient, um, sort of well-crafted code. Yep. Um, and forth is, uh, is, I think, a great language for, for doing that uh, because of the, the discipline that it imposes upon a coder, which uh, ironically is my, my very next subject. So when you took the decision uh, that, uh, that a scripting language, or you might even call it a virtual machine, needed to be a part of, of Bitcoin, um, there are probably a lot of choices in front of you. Uh, we've seen some token um, uh, platforms use JavaScript, for example, as a as a as a, a compute engine. Um, so why why fourth in particular? Fourth is very small and efficient. And it's a language I've used quite a lot in my past. Uh, my uncle was um, um, heavily involved in the Air Force, so my um, um, grandfather was an engineer and mathematician and, and other things as well. And um, in both cases, um, going right back through the 80s, fourth was a fairly common language that I used. Um, some C, um, eventually C++, but when I first started it was only C. I'm just making myself sound old now. Um, but um, fourth, it's very small efficient. It's very easy to check. Um, it's very easy to write good code that you can find the errors and um, validate the results very quickly. Mm. Um, if you look at something like Java, it's very easy to make mistakes and bad code. Mm. And I think that has something to do with the, with the enforced discipline required uh, to, to manage stack state. Um, well, some of this actually comes down to um, if you screw up in fourth, it won't work. Mm. Um, whereas if you screw up in Java, it can work, but every now and again you get strange results. Yep. Now, when you're talking about monetary and financial systems, it's not something you want. Mm. You actually want something that fails before it gets to the compile stage. Mm. Yes, ideally, yeah. I mean, and Java is, is designed to be a fail fast. Uh, language uh, and one of the features I particularly like about it is static typing because it um, forces things to fail a long time before you even get to compile but um, uh, 